Welcome to Start Up With Poland, where we get into the nuts and bolts behind Poland's startup ecosystem. My guest today is Kamil Folkert, CEO of the startup Occubee. Occubee is a SaaS solution for retailers that uses AI and ML to help users effectively manage the supply chain. Now, Camille describes himself as an engineer with a humanistic heart that's committed to an exciting endeavor from a software developer and IT architect to a C-level manager. He has a PhD in data mining and an impressive C-level background. However, he is also an Ironman triathlon competitor and underlines that he very much likes time with his family. So let's find out more about Occubi, the challenges of being a CEO, and how Camille manages to balance this work life. So Camille, absolutely fantastic to have you with us here today. Thanks for having me. Now, please get us started with explaining what actually is Occubi and what problem are you solving? So Occubi is a platform uh, delivered in a software as a service fashion that actually enables retailers and producers mm -hmm. to use uh, AI, mm -hmm. machine learning, to leverage their historical data so they can better prepare for the future. That means okay. we are translating the historical data into the forecasts mm -hmm. of sales and demand so then the retailers can optimize their supply chain processes to, for example, avoid overstocks or out of stocks. Mm -hmm. That directly translates to the bottom line. Okay, well, fantastic. And it really makes an impact on, on for those clients that you've already got. It's, it really actually, you know, of course you're going to say yes, but you know, <laughs> could, do you have some examples of how, you know, in, in, real, in real life, uh, in real company life, this solution has benefited the businesses? There are actually many differences between different flavors of retail, I would say. So there uh -huh. are different improvement levels that we can achieve as well. But just to give you the, the overview, uh, in FMCG retail, mm -hmm. it's quite common that with uh, decent quality forecasts, you can reduce uh, out of stocks by 50%. Oh, wow. It's huge. Okay. Okay. Well, I did also read in a description, you know, about OQB that you do use uh, actual human consultants. And this made me think, well, does this show that despite the fact that OQB is powered so much by AI solutions, you know, does actually uh, it show that AI cannot replace uh, every element, every role in, in a company? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting topic in general. Uh, I think many of uh, many of experts in, in the field uh, were discussing about this specific mm -hmm. issue for years, and yet they did not predict what happened with generative AI. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how many creative jobs could potentially be, maybe not replaced, but augmented with, with mm -hmm. AI nowadays with uh, those models like GPT or DALI or other. Um, so it's hard for me to say if AI will completely replace some jobs or not, probably not. Uh, I think about Occupy and the AI part of it as kind of like autopilot. Okay. Uh, so in the plane, um, the aircraft goes uh, through different stages of the flight. And in some of them, it's actually nice to have the autopilot. So that will take care of those most repeatable tasks. So then the pilots, the human um, element of the whole, let's say, uh, security mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and safety aspect of the flight. Uh, the, the man that is responsible and, and uh, takes care about the, the, all the passengers can focus really deeply on those moments where it's needed. Mm -hmm. Same in business. So in OQB, uh, we believe that uh, what we can do for demand planners, also for uh, supply chain directors mm -hmm. and, and also uh, C-level executives, is we provide uh, a tool that actually enables them to fully utilize their potential of their own data. Okay, but the, that human consultant is mm. still a key to, to Absolutely. element. And that's also interesting because when you think about different aspects of AI, um, technically some methods are unexplainable. Some are, mm -hmm. but uh, there is this whole field of explainable AI, which is getting more and more uh, interesting. Um, our clients very often ask, like, what's actually the factor that influenced this specific model to give me this number for, let's say, why do I need to deliver this number of goods of this specific SKU for this store? 
and sometimes it's really hard to explain. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that it's equally hard to explain why the demon planner's brain forecasted that number. So, you know, we are applying this expectation of uh, AI to be explainable uh, to the technical elements, but very often we don't really know that in everyday life we use AI a lot, like Google mm -hmm. Maps. Mm -hmm. uh, we use a lot of assistance uh, in the car, probably when, I'm not sure if you drive, but if, if you are driving by car here today, first, you can't explain why, why Google suggested this route. Yeah, it was some factors, maybe traffic, maybe something else. Uh, and second, but, you, but second, you can also explain why your brain steered the steering wheel like that on the specific circumstances on the road. Okay. So there are a lot yeah, of unexplainable things. Yet we try to provide, of course, the assistance. Yes, we have consultants. That's a very important part of our, of our job to provide uh, this adoption of AI okay. in the business. Okay, okay, that, that all, all makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, Kevin, you have worked for a number of years in various C-level positions, but it's only actually relatively for a short time that you've been the CEO mm. and, you know, sort of leading the ship at yeah. Occubia around about eight months. And what have you found to be, you know, the, the real challenges uh, and the biggest difference, I suppose, from, from the other roles you previously mm. held to, to actually, you know, being the CEO? You know, my role evolved in those C-level positions from the most technical, so uh, CTO, okay. towards the yep. one I have right now, through different stages. And the biggest transition was actually on the very beginning, mm -hmm. like uh, changing from specialist role, because I was, before I was I was programmer or the developer, and then architect of the software solutions for, for our clients, and then jumping into the managerial role. That was the big shift for me, because suddenly you become responsible for other people that are doing the job yeah. that you used to do before. And that's completely different set of skills required and mm -hmm. different mindset yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to enable others to be then uh, performing, not perform yourself, those, yeah, those yeah, jobs. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. then moving forward from CTO um, through chief strategy officer, uh, when I had to put more focus on the relationships with investors, mm -hmm. fundraising mm -hmm. aspects and mm -hmm. this kind of things through uh, CRO and I was then touching uh, more on the aspects of sales marketing and introducing customer success area to our mm -hmm. operations. Towards CEO, I think this transition was apparently more and more smooth when, when, when it go uh, further. Okay. So actually now when I think the biggest challenge of the last eight months, that's definitely understanding uh, the role and the complexity of the whole diverse culture and team that we have. Mm -hmm. So I can be uh, a better leader, better uh, enabler of mm -hmm. people's mm -hmm. performance, mm -hmm. uh, utilizing their best strengths, making sure that they work on their uh, weaknesses and that we are all fully aware or, or fully aware and supportive to each other on how we can focus, how we can communicate better. So definitely, I fully agree on the meeting we had with Przemek recently, Przemek Schmidt. I fully support this CEO stands for Chief Emotional Officer. <laughs> and that's very often my job right now to also enable the team uh, with this kind of uh, emotional slash communication slash soft skills uh, so they can better work with each other. So in a way, you've almost become the sort of HR person in some senses I, I don't want to um, I don't want to say too much about that in the context of HR because I'm far from being HR, HR expert for sure but I feel that was my main focus in the last months definitely okay. and I had to invest a lot uh, myself into my personal and professional development to better understand uh, those soft skills that were not coming yeah, from my yeah, let's say, yeah. education times or previous experiences. Yeah, well, no, that's exactly, I mean, that's actually the next thing I wanted to ask you, because I looked at your mm. background, which is incredibly impressive, but, you know, very technical. You have a PhD yeah. in data mining, you so, know, you have a lot of skills, which obviously directly put you as a fantastic, you know, person to be part of OQB. Uh, but I did think, you know, but how does that translate into the soft skills, you know, mm. how have, you know, you ha had to change, I guess, as a person, ignoring, you know, as a, as a, as a working person, mm. but, you know, as a, as a person emotionally almost. Uh, that's, that's also interesting for me. Historically, before I, I have chosen to study computer science and then to do the PhD as a follow-up uh, on, on those studies, I was considering to go for maybe I will be a journalist or musician. Uh -huh. You know, oh, I had wow. this, I, I had I have this kind of background. 
So actually those, let's say, humanistic uh, elements of uh, not only science, but also mm -hmm. da daily life are very close to me. So now having this opportunity, opportunity to coming back to uh, more interpersonal uh, aspects of the daily work, it's, it's very uh, rewarding. Okay, well, no, I, I, I think that's you know, fantastic to hear that you know you did have, it's not that you've been a data scientist from birth, <laughs> we know that <laughs> no, no, now. No. You, have, you have, you know, uh, obviously got the other aspects, which actually as well, I read that you're mm. uh, a very big uh, fan of uh, Ironman triathlon. Oh, yeah. And this is something I also wanted to ask you about, and you know, how does that fit in around or you know maybe there are some similarities actually with mm. being a ceo to you know the challenges you face in those triathlons maybe i'm mistaken for sure there are actually a lot of uh, people in business do those triathlons mm -hmm. i i met many many people uh with similar roles okay. uh, doing doing long and short distance triathlons for me the history was a bit different uh actually i i stepped into triathlon as former swimmer so okay. I, I used to train swimming for many many years um then I had a break uh, for doing my PhD and um, I decided to get back because I wanted to get back in shape. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I was uh, diagnosed with this rare, uh, rare disease, uh, muscle psychosis at this time and triathlon certainly helped me to get through this hard time uh, of being diagnosed and, and uh, this mental health aspect mm -hmm. was addressed mm -hmm. by simply uh, indulging myself into long That's sessions of, of training. Nowadays, I see a lot of similarities between uh, endurance sports uh -huh. in general and, and business, you need to be resilient, you know there will be problems and you need to make sure that you have the mindset that will make, make push through it, you, you push you know, through it, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, there is this process over outcomes aspect of, you know, consistently showing up, doing those small things every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's clear that there is no this kind of overnight success, mm -hmm. both in sports and business. From sports you get more controlled feedback mm -hmm. so you can learn actually much easier than from okay. business in business it's so many outside elements like market competition uh, innovations mm -hmm. that are coming mm -hmm. from outside you can't predict them they have no control you have no that. control yeah in in long distance triathlon you know you know you will be suffering for many hours <laughs> you are setting up your yourself for success by just showing up day after day after day after day for a few years probably just to build this uh, metabolic capacity and mm -hmm, endurance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, elements of, of the whole body. Yeah. I mean, you know, generally, I think being a startup founder, and that's certainly something that I think our audience mm. will have learned from some of my yeah. previous guests, you know, it's, it's tough, right? It's yeah. not the easy decision to make. And, you know, how do you, you know, in being in a startup, leading a startup, um, you know, allow for yourself to have a work-life balance? You know, how do you fit in all these? I know that also mm. you have a family who you love yeah. spending time with, etc. To fit it all in, to do it, you know, giving, giving at the same time, I'm sure your absolute best. And wouldn't it, second part of the same question, but, you know, wouldn't it be easier to simply go and, you know, get a job somewhere in, I don't know, a corporation? <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I suppose in a way, what motivates you? How do you fit it all in yeah. and what motivates you to carry on going? Uh, it's, it's a complex question, of course. It's about um, which path to choose in life and what motivates. Uh, for, for me, it's definitely learning and developing myself. Uh -huh. I, uh -huh. I remember I was recruited by, by Michael, who, who used to be my CEO for, for mm -hmm. years. And now I, I had this opportunity to, to step into his role. Uh, which was not easy from this gratitude perspective because, you know, I, I always adored him as, as my leader and now I'm working with him with th those different roles. But I told him, it was 13 years ago on our first meeting, I will want to stay in this company as long as I can learn and uh, I'm still there. So I'm, I'm pr probably also motivated by being consistent in choices okay, yeah, yeah, and that yeah. helps a lot because if I committed to now building OQB out of which we just built as, as a spin-off out of this software house business, definitely is something I committed myself to. And that's very similar to my uh, family uh, life and choices in, in private life. That's similar to triathlon, that's similar to other uh, different things I do in, in my life. Probably that's also um, important from the perspective of this, let's say, perseverance or resilience. Yeah, it's, it's easier yeah, to stick to yeah. something because once you, want, once you quit, you will have this tendency to quit more, and more often. That's very um, common in, in races, by the way. In triathlon, 
even if I'm a bit injured or it's not my day, I know it will be not great time at the finish line. I want to continue and get to the finish line because if I quit, it will be so much easier to quit the next time. Well, that's, that's uh, I, I, I think, a deep thought for, for many of us to keep keep with us uh, in whatever we're persevering in, you know, that then once you quit, it can become something that, you know, once you do it once, it can become something easier. But um, what are your plans? And I suppose I now me more in a business sense with mm. OQB, you know, you say you want to stay in the company as long as you, you keep on learning. But, but, you know, what is the direction that OQB is mm. going in? Which way do you see the company developing? Um. It's similar to my personal path, actually. So I've, I had this time when I was exploring a lot. And with OQB, we did the same. We've been exploring a lot recently. Mm -hmm. First of all, we've built a product which is uh, architecturally complex. From the IT mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. it has a lot of technologies to be able to serve those, those different needs of our clients. So that was one learning path, let's say. But the second one was commercialization. Mm -hmm. So we have explored different verticals. And as I said on the beginning, actually those differences between retailers are quite significant. Pretty large, yeah. So uh, from fashion through FMCG, uh, home decor, health and beauty, mm -hmm. pharmacies, those are completely different businesses. They have mm -hmm. something in common, of course. And the historical data even is very similar sometimes from the, let's say, uh, structural perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, the level of help, of the level of AI being possible to be used in those businesses is different. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think for OQB, it's a time uh, to be more focused now. Uh, so we will actually uh, seek for those paths uh, with those clients where we can help the most. Okay. To, just okay. to maximize the ROI for our, for our clients and for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I think that I should do it in my private life as well, like to be more, <laughs> more, more focused. focused. <laughs> I, have, I have this tendency, and you ask about this work-life balance, I, I don't I don't really believe in that, to be honest. In, in my case, for many years, it's already like work-life blend, I would say. Okay, I like that. So, um, and also trainings uh, that you mentioned, it's a part of my life, uh, quite, quite important uh, to, to keep my homeostasis. So basically, I try to blend everything. So for example, that means that I, I do my bike rides to the office, then from the office, of course, sometimes I call my family, but also I work from home in the mornings to avoid traffic. Uh, if I have to go by car, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, it's constant logistics and blending everything. Uh, so and then, optimization as yeah, well, efficiency. Because, you know, you know people, people very often ask me, uh, but uh, I, I would have no time to do this. And the, the fact is, we all have the same amount of time. Yeah. We all have 24 hours per one day. So it's basically the choice or decision at the end. How would you like to maximize your ROI yeah, personally yeah, in life yeah. by being more focused? Uh, for me, it's, it's really getting um, easier once I go further. Uh, I learned, for example, what kind of uh, work I can do from, from home, what I can't. In this hybrid era of work, it's, it's uh -huh. super important to also yeah, yeah, yeah. know what's, what's possible, what's not possible. Uh, where do I need people? Where do, you, where do I need to be alone? Uh, that helps a lot. And blending uh, family life, blending travels uh, with, with trainings, with, with work, with self-development, it's super important for me. Oh, well, I think, you know, that's, that's uh, something I'm immediately now, you know, whilst you're talking, thinking, what can I do to optimize, you know, mm. here and, and, and make more efficient here. But, you know, I think that's both, both in terms of the business sense of, you know, like, right, we're really going to focus. You've had the exploration mm. phase of finding yeah. what works, what works less well, etc. And really fo finding that focus, but also, you know, uh, really in all areas of life, doing the bits that are most important is, uh, I think, something that we can all take away from this conversation with you, Camille. Thank so, you so much. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to all of our guests on Startup with Poland. See you next time.